So where we're going to go this morning is Romans chapter 8. Uh, absolutely chocked full of you know, more, more truth than, than most believers will ever glean out of all of Scripture is contained in this one chapter. Just to give you an idea of the volumes of the knowledge of God that are contained just in the book of Romans, a um, guy named Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a, a preacher in the middle of the last century in England, uh, he preached on Friday nights, he preached through the book of Romans, and it only took him a mere 13 years. Now, could you imagine? You, know, you, you think I'm, <laughs> I'm long-winded. Um, but he had a lot to say. And you know why? Because Paul had a lot to say. You know why? Because God had a lot to say. God has a lot to say to us out of his word. And there's not any of it that we don't need to be aware of. All of it is God breathed. All of it is good. It's good for correction, encouragement, direction. It's good that God would speak to us. And I, I really trust that that is what is going to happen today through his word, by his spirit, God is going to speak to us. And he's going to speak to us some things that we desperately need some of us to be reminded of, others of us to be made aware of for the very first time in, a, in an embracing the word of the Lord sort of way. I'm positive many of the things I'll share this morning I've said before. But we need to hear what the word of the Lord has to say. It's got a few verses that we've chosen out of the eighth chapter of Romans. We're going to start in verse 33. Read down through 39. It says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we shall be we are killed all the day long we are counted as sheep for the slaughter yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for i am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of god which is in christ jesus our lord who shall bring anything any charge against God's elect. I know it seems like a really strange thing to be among a, a general Baptist church because the general Baptist churches I grew up in, um, you just didn't get messages on the election of God. I mean, they, those preachers, they, they recognized, they, they recognized that it was in scripture and there was a place for it in their theology, but there was not typically boldness to go ahead and just say it. God elects those who are his own. God chooses those who are his own. You know, this idea of free will 
which I fully embrace the, the freedom of the will. God isn't coercing anyone, no, no arms behind the back. None of that God is, is giving you free choice in, in all of these matters. But this is God's election. God does elect those who are his own. If you are his, you are his by his choosing. Some might think, what's the big deal? It's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. Uh, as it affected me personally, I'll just give you testimony as to how that doctrine of election, and I'll say it differently, the reality of God's election, what that did in my life, was it gave me grace to stop asking God to do that which he'd already done. I, like all believers, especially in the early stages of walking out your, your life in Christ, I, I was weak. I failed somewhat regularly. Still failed. But at that time, my failure would cause me to swirl the drain, is what I always would call it. I could not be good enough long enough. And as soon as I would fail, I would immediately go into a spiral of asking God to, to please accept me. Accept me. Now, that, that, was, that was a bit on the crazy side, seeing how he had already chosen me. Why would he need to accept me yet again and when I realized that when I was when I was begging God to do that which he'd already done it set me free free to serve him free to realize that I was his and that he was mine that he loved me and there was nothing that would separate there was nothing there that, that could pull that, that could rip that relationship Apart because God was the establisher of it. Jesus tells his disciples, I chose you. You did not choose me. But every single one of them. When Jesus came to those that were by the seashore and said, follow me. What did they do? They immediately dropped their nets and they followed him. But he said, follow me. He had chosen them. No one here. No one here responded to God without first God giving an invitation. God chooses. God chooses to aggress towards man that we might reciprocate and come to him in faith and become followers of him. It is no one can bring a, a charge against God's elect. Because God has already paid all the penalty for those believers. God has paid all of that penalty in the person of his own son's sacrifice upon the cross. So it's been taken out of the way. Nothing, nothing can separate. And then he, he begins to enumerate those things which we might think would be potential separation what about these things all of these things are common to man all of these things are common to the the christian experience at one level or another some people experience some of these things to a massive degree others maybe not so much but all of these are experienced by every believer and the place I want to start this morning, I guess it's a little late to start. The next place that I want to go this morning is to the word in, in verse 37. Yet in all these things, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. In these things, 
not in the absence of these things, because that, that's the mindset of many believers in this hour, and many will shipwreck over that reality that they think they will have been spared from every kind of grief, every kind of, uh, of negative experience, every kind of, of pain and suffering. None of that can abide in the Christian life. How do you square that? With this passage of scripture where Paul is telling us that in all of these things, we will be more than conquerors. It doesn't say over all of these things. It is in these things that we will be more than conquerors. For, for the last, honestly, few months now, that concept of more than conquerors has been stuck in my in my brain how is it how is it that we are what what does it even mean to be more than a conqueror in just studying and seeking the lord for this message i don't think this is exhaustive but i'm, I'm positive that a portion at least of what is what, what the lord is conveying to us through that statement is this Paul, to get the context of it, Paul is writing to who? Romans. He's writing to Roman believers who crucified the Son of God. It was Rome. Who was persecuting the church? Rome, among others. But Rome was the superpower the empire of the day, they had all the power. They had all of that which, which could, could exert control over people. Yet, Paul says, or God says through Paul, better said, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. There is a sense in which more than conqueror means, think about it. Rome had conquered most of the known world at that time. Their, their, their empire went through at least a portion of Great Britain. It went all the way down through Spain. It went, all of the Mediterranean was theirs. Asia Minor was theirs all the way up into what would be you know, just, just north of of present day Austria, all of that was their territory. They had conquered it. But Paul says, you're more than a conqueror. What's the dimensions of the Roman Empire today? Be hard pressed to find it, wouldn't you? Think about that. More than a conqueror, one of the implications of that is you are more than a conqueror because what conqueror has ever conquered not then to himself be conquered? Every one of them. Nebuchadnezzar, there was none greater in his day. Alexander the Great, none greater in his day. King Cyrus and Darius and all of those Babylonian and Assyrian you know, world-conquering people. Every one of them. There was a time whenever the, the sun didn't set upon the British Empire. Yet what a small, pared down version of that we see today. Every conqueror then subsequently gets conquered. You are more than a conqueror in that your victory will never have to be surrendered. Your victory, your Conquering is permanent, never to be yielded, never to be sacrificed, never to be supplanted by another who would come because our victor, we have our victory in him who even defeated death. Nothing stands in it and we have entered into his victory. Our victory is permanent. Our victory is complete. 
Yes, we fight battle after battle. We fight the battle of the, in the battlefield of our mind. We fight it in the everydayness of our decisions. We fight battle after battle, but we are more than conquerors in the sense that it is complete. It is a settled fact in the reality that resides in God. It is not in question. Romans also makes some other declarations, things like, you're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He has declared a destiny for all those that are his that you will be just like Jesus. You will conquer everything, every last weakness, every last fault and failure, every last one of them will be purged from you and you will conquer it all. Not in your own power, not in your own strength, or you could not be more than a conqueror. But because you have your conquering in him who has already conquered death, there is none that can stand in your way, which is honestly his way. He is the one, we are in him, and in him we have defeated every enemy. All things are coming under his feet. So let's go back now and look at these things. These things that we are more than conquerors in. Because some people would lead you to believe that the experience of any of, the, any of these is due to a lack of faith. Nothing could be farther than from the truth. These are things that are common to the human condition in its fallen state. All of these things are experienced by people in and outside of Christ. They are common to man. And we share in that fallen humanity. Therefore, we share in the experience. But in these things, we are more than conquerors. In them, the first one, shall tribulation Tribulation, you know, with the, the mindset of the, the modern church, we think of tribulation, we think of the great tribulation. Yes, even that couldn't take care, couldn't, couldn't defeat God's people because we are more than conquerors. What is actually being expressed there when it talks about tribulation, the root word of it speaks to pressure, the pressures of life. Do you experience any pressure? Think about it for just a second. What are the pressures that you feel? Pressures to perform, pressures to provide, pressures to defend oneself, pressures to all sorts of different pressures come from so many different sources, some internal, some external, all of those things. He's speaking to people who were Roman subjects who had been identified as persona non grata. They were unwelcomed in the kingdom because they would not offer a pinch of incense to Caesar who had proclaimed himself to be God because they thought there is only one God. So there was pressure. There was pressure to conform to the spirit of the age. There was pressure. Tribulation spoke of pressure and there is pressure on you every day. internal and external, but the pressures, in those pressures, we all experience them. It, it's tempting to look at people who live this out in a fairly consistent and, and victorious way. We look at them and they think, well, it's like they don't have a pressure in the world. Not a chance. Probably they have more pressure than anyone you know because they made themselves a target. Heard a couple of people in the last week say this, that you know you're on the tar over the target when you start catching flack. 
So as soon as you begin to be more and more useful to the kingdom, there will be more and more tribulation pressures headed your way because you will be seen as a threat. You'll be seen as a threat to the culture around you. You will be seen to be a threat to governmental authority. You will be seen to be a threat by, by hell and, and Satan and all of his. Everything about you will be threat and you will receive pressure in return. In that... In that one place, it says, in that we greatly rejoice, seeing that we're worthy to suffer for his sake. In that, you are more than a conqueror, because there is no pressure that can cause you to yield. But Tracy, you don't understand how weak I am. You don't, you don't understand how many times I've failed. You don't understand... I probably don't understand your particular situation, but believe me, I have yielded to pressure enough to know what pressure is. I've experienced enough pressure to realize, and I've experienced the power of God so that I know that if I yield to pressure, if I yield to pressure, it is because I yielded. It wasn't a lack of the power of God. It wasn't, there, there was no insufficiency in him that caused me to do that, that thing or to yield to that pressure to conform to the world and not to Christ. It was, it was not, we are more than conquerors in this, that our victory is assured. A conqueror. A conqueror goes forth to conquer, and, and he will go out to take that land and possess it for himself and to express his rule and control over it. What does that look like in the Christian life? It looks like this. The fruit of the Spirit, in the very last one, it says self-control. Self-control. I would rank you among the most powerful human beings on planet Earth if you can control yourself. Honestly, it would be far easier to control this nation than it is for one to control himself. So when it's talking about a conqueror and being more than a conqueror, it's talking about you conquer being a conqueror over all the internals ha having having your life under control it, it's the fruit of the spirit none of us possess in ourselves the ability to do that but in christ we have been made more than conquerors we can be conquerors over and more than conquerors over the pressures of this life distress Distress, that, that word that was translated distress there, it, it literally means narrowness of place. So the idea there is restriction, constriction, being, being confined. Can anybody relate to restriction? Are there any restrictions in our culture? today is there anything that anybody is is trying to get you to do that you don't see any kind of of wisdom in is there is there i'm here to tell you this morning you are more than a conqueror who will you yield to if you have submitted to christ if you're going to be ruled and you you will live free from restriction you you cannot live free from the desire of others to restrict your life there are things that others will say you can't say that and immediately you'll say on the inside but it's true what was the apostles example to us 
Huh. But we cannot. We, we cannot but say those things which we have seen and heard. Should we obey God or man? Now this isn't a, an excuse for rebellion, by the way. In all things that are of a neutral nature, we are to be in, in submission to governmental authority. But what we're talking about here is the restriction of us as it relates to our ability to speak the truth, our ability to hear the truth, and our ability to obey the truth. When God has given you a direction, and whether it's your own fear, whether it's pressures from the outside, whatever it would be that would restrict us from living in full and free obedience to God, that right there, you are more than a conqueror over. But it must be conquered. But that's the other reality, that in all of these things, there will be a battle. And in all of these things, you are more than conquerors. Forever, forever, your restrictions are broken. I mean, how, how do you end up on a cross upside down? like Peter? How are you separated from your head like Paul? Freedom. Freedom to follow the Lord when others would restrict. There's another layer of this coming in the very next one, which is, or persecution. Persecution is completely powerless to thwart your conquering in the midst of persecution. So <clears throat> whenever distress, whenever restrictions goes that next step to persecution and you speak the truth in love under the power of the Holy Spirit and others become threatened by that and their response is intimidation. Now we think of persecution in terms of you know physical harm imprisonment martyrdom we, we think about persecution in those terms but what's its purpose what, what's the purpose of persecution the purpose of persecution is intimidation 100 percent if, if they were to kill you for speaking the truth it would have two purposes. One would be to shut you up and the other to intimidate and shut up a hundred other people that know about your martyrdom. See, th this is what we have to recognize as well as other things about this. This was spoken into a time of persecution. This was spoken into a people that were not unacquainted with persecution, that, that intimidation on several different fronts, some of it local, some of it was religious. You know, these very same people would be, would be opposed and persecuted by the synagogues. So they had the, the Jewish religious folk were persecuting. They would have the Romans who were persecuting. There would be other factions. At one point, it was because they had, had done such damage to the idol makers trade that the idol makers union rose up against them and opposed them and persecuted them. So, I mean, there's lots of different sources of persecution, but it's all about intimidation. I'm here to tell you this morning that in Christ, you are more than a conqueror over every form of intimidation. You need not yield to any intimidation tactic by any force, internal or external. You're more than a conqueror. Your victory is complete. It's a settled fact in the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the next time you become aware that you are facing intimidation, just win. 
just went right there on the spot to do exactly the opposite thing that that intimidation is requiring that the intimidation is demanding of you do if they say shut up you stand up you speak the truth if they if they tell you to be quiet shout it from the housetop you are more than a conqueror in Christ it's in these things that we conquer it is not in the fact that God loves us and is going to make all of these things be absent from our life he does love us unquestionably but he loves us so as to let us experience the Christ or the the human experience but to be victors in the midst of it victors over tribulation distress persecution Famine or nakedness. I lump those two together because the, the, the common denominator there is lack. Lack of the necessary things. Lack of... I mean, famine is not when you're... Instead of eating high off the hog, you're eating low off the hog. It, it's, that, that's not what it's talking about. Famine is when you don't have... Nakedness is not to walk around in ragged clothing. It's to have none. But when we look at this and we see the deprivation that is part of the human experience to the degree that you experience that, you can be a conqueror, more than a conqueror in the midst of it. How does that occur? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Where is your treasure? Is your treasure stored up in heaven where moth doesn't corrupt and or where rust doesn't corrupt and moth doesn't, you know, eat a, a hole and and cause it to fall out and be lost? How, how do you view your possessions, that which you have been blessed to have? I mean, God gives each one of us the ability to accumulate a certain amount of wealth, some very little, some have great fortunes. What do you, you tell me, what will you have 200 years from now? It's only what's done for Christ that will last. Sure, you can leave a blessing behind and make things you know, easier on future generations. That, that's all possible. And, and then there's nothing in the word of God that would prevent you from, from doing so. It would actually encourage you to do so. But what do you do with lack? Do you see lack as a curse? Or do you see lack as an opportunity to conquer? Paul is laying it out before us in this passage. He's laying it out there to the degree that you suffer lack. And I would take it way past these two uh, headings right here that they are indicative of but not exhaustive list of those things which we can lack. Some people lack family. I mean, I have always been surrounded by an abundance of family. I mean, you, you've heard me tell the stories. My, my oldest son, when he was born, 14 grandparents, none of which lived more than 10 miles from our home. Surrounded by family. I'm satisfied there are people here this morning who have very little family or very little family that's close either close relationally or close physically. You, you suffer lack in the area of relations, family relationships. In that, you can be more than a conqueror. So, some have, have a, they're in a, a financial pinch. It is a difficult time and they are suffering lack Comparatively speaking to the people that we live around, typically the, the, the poorest among us are, are rich on a global 
comparison. But when we look amongst ourselves and we see that there are those who, who have genuine lack, that they, they really do have difficulty putting food on the table for their family. I mean, that, that's a reality for folks. When we look at the, what, what they can be a conqueror in the midst of that circumstance. That does not necessarily mean that that circumstance will be relieved in the, in the temporal situation. There, there are people, there are Christian people starving in certain areas of the globe today. They, they are starving. But do they have all that they need? Or do they need more than Jesus? We have to learn to look at our circumstances through the lens of eternity. Yes, they, they suffer in the here and now, but who among us will not experience some suffering? What do we do with it? And do we conquer are we more than conquerors in the midst of every form of pressure and suffering? It's laid out here. It is yours for the taking. It's like somebody is, is, is passing it out and it's like, oh, okay. That could be mine. It, it's, it, it's God's insisting that you take this. Take this conqueror's attitude and, and live victorious over those things. Peril. Peril just simply means danger. All sorts of different dangers. I mean, we can definitely see the dangers that we face in a, in a time of, of global pandemic, but that is not even close to the tip of the iceberg on all the dangers. I mean, one could really, one could really end up in a dark place if you just focused on all the dangers of this life. Yeah, I'm not even aware of how many times I came within three or four feet of having a wreck on the way to, to church this morning. I don't recall if I, met five or 15 vehicles between here and home. Didn't even, didn't even cross my mind. But every one of those is a danger. There are dangers in that people will, will actually be coming after you for certain things. I mean, there, there's a side of advertising that plays towards you know, your, your pleasure centers, you know, you will be really happy if, if you find this Lexus under your tree, you know, that, you, the, all of those commercials. Well, then you've got home title lock. Your house may already have been stolen. There's dangers. There's dangers everywhere. There's dangers on the roads. There's dangers in, in having a conversation with somebody. You, you could be transferred something, you know, worse than COVID. There, there's all sorts of dangers everywhere. There's dangers in eating a hamburger. There's dangers in eating most of the things I eat. There, there's dangers all over the place. Danger. You can be a conqueror in the midst of every form of danger that is portrayed before you. Um, not going to take a long time in this, but I, I'm in the process of listening to an audio book right now. And, and a guy is talking about, um, it, the name of it is death by living. It, and, and it is, it is one of the better, it's one of the only books I've ever read that, that is kind of like this, but he uses the story of his own grandparents' lives. And then he kind of overlays that on episodes out of his own life and how the Lord is faithful in all of these things. And in one of them, he was talking about bluffing his way through a roadblock in the Rockies. He had his Yukon, which did not have the best, it was four wheel drive, but it did not have the best of tires on. And it was snowing up in the passes and he bluffed his way through and 
they let him go on when they were stopping almost everybody else. And then it's a whiteout and there's no guardrails and people then were stopping in the middle of the road in front of him and he had nearly had how many wrecks and he was he was losing control and sliding down mountain roads sideways and then he began to think you know my grandfather his jeep was blown up by a bomb and he was found yards away and machine gun fire was all about him and Marines took him and, and threw him into the last moving plane that was leaving out on Iwo Jima. And there you know, I was on Guadalcanal and he was, he was gone. And then he, later on he gets lost at sea in a plane and finally is, is located and he comes in and, and he, he runs out of fuel just before the runway and he lands it. A B-17 is a glider, and then he realizes those were God's people, and they were in his hand, and he's seen them through. And he's seen through the ones that were on either side of his grandpa who, who, who were shot through and killed. He, he, he'd seen all of those through, and he who cares for the sparrow is caring for me on this isolated mountain road, regardless of the danger, I'm safe in his hands. Regardless, if we go off the edge and we all die in the tumble down the mountain, we're in his hands. He was more than a conqueror on that night. He faced danger and he conquered it by not being controlled by it. He conquered it by not being moved by it, by not embracing fear, but embracing faith and standing up in the midst of it. It didn't get any safer just because he acknowledged the sovereignty of God and the providence of God over his life. It did not get safer. You look at the history of, of believers down through the centuries, physically, Emotionally, in most ways that we think of in our normal, natural life, it is not safe. It is not safe to follow God. This seems like a really good time to inject one of my favorite lines out of the, out of the Chronicles of Narnia. Whenever Lucy asks the little... Um, deer looking guy I can't remember his name now but asks him when she sees Aslan the lion walking away down the seashore he says he's a lion is he safe the guy turns back to her and says he's not safe but he's good it's not safe to be a believer not not in the natural but there is no safer place now and in eternity than in the sovereign grace of God to commit yourself to him and his safe care over you. That, that no matter what comes, I will not fear regardless of the danger that I am exposed to, I will not fear. I'll not be controlled by fear. I will conquer fear. You will face it. You will face your share of danger. And you will be faced with your share of fears. You can conquer them 100%. You can be more than a conqueror over those things. Because there's no one who can defeat you. Other than you. But there's no one that can defeat you when it comes to facing the dangers of this life. And the last one was, or sword. Later in the book of Romans, Paul talks about that our relationship to the governing authorities because they are not a threat to good but to evil. So legitimate governmental, how to say it best, legitimate governmental 
authority expressed over a people is not to be feared but to be cooperated with because it punishes evil and not good. So if that government authority goes to punishing good and not evil, that's what he's talking about here. He's not just talking about those that would threaten your life. He is talking about the sword in the same sense that he says in that same passage I just referred to that they do not bear the sword in vain. He is speaking to Romans who were very well aware of those who carried the sword. Those Roman soldiers who were the, the shock troops of their day, who were those who would keep the, they would keep Palestine in line. They kept Rome in line. And they were the enforcers. It says, you're more than conquerors over the sword. Over the sword. Now, how is that? How are you more than a conqueror? Well, this is where it brings me to the, 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 the last way that I want to lay out that phrase more than a conqueror before our hearts and minds this morning. You're more than a conqueror in the same way because you are, you, you are in the victory that Jesus won. How did Jesus win his victory? He won it over the cross. He won it on the cross, made a show of all principalities and powers, triumphing over it in his cross. Then on the third day, raising victorious over death, hell, and the grave. You are more than a conqueror in the sense that Jesus, how did he end up on a cross? Those, those two enemies we talked about earlier. The Jews conspired against him, the Jewish leadership, I should say, not, not the Jews, but the Jewish religious leaders conspired against him and the Romans conspired. And those two together crucified him. How did Jesus, how did Jesus become a victor by being crucified? He was more than a conqueror in that his enemies, his enemies won for him his victory. Everything that they brought against him gave him the capacity to be victorious. And the very same thing is true of you. As the world, the flesh, and the devil conspire to bring to us tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and the sword. As all of those things are headed our way, being aimed at us as fiery darts from the evil one. As he does that, it is his very own actions that are the means for our victory. They killed Jesus, and he didn't even put up a fight. But why would he? It was for that which he was born. They don't put up a fight in the, in the sense of in, in flesh and blood. Your enemies are the principalities and powers. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We, we fight against the, the rulers of this dark age, we, we fight a spiritual battle. But in the very real flesh and blood world where all of this is played out, when, when any of these things come against you, it's for your good. Same chapter. All things work together for good. To those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. And again here, in all these things, you are more than conquerors. I, I honestly, I, I have my suspicions, and I believe that they are well-founded, that we're going to get to enjoy more of these things in the future than we have in the past. 
but we're more than conquerors. Come what may, send your worst devil. Send it because the, the more you send, the more we conquer. The, the more opposition that we get, the more victory, the, the more complete our conquering is because our battle is on the inside. I'm not, I'm not fighting to keep from having something to happen to me on the outside. I'm fighting to keep possession of that which God has done in me on the inside. The same is true of you. As Paul was persuaded, life or death, life, angels, principalities, powers, Things present, things to come, height, depth, nor any other created thing. Just in case you might be able to dream something up that you think would be beyond the victory that Christ has given to us in his own cross and in his resurrection. It, that victory is so complete, your imagination cannot contrive a thing that would actually be able to separate you from the love of Christ, which is in Christ, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what is the battle? That's the battle. We find ultimately that in this expression at the end, and even toward the beginning, it says it much the same way, not being separated from the love of God. Having that victory, I'm going to use it one more time, an opportunity to bring it back to our first parents who, when the devil came and said, has God really said? No, oh, he just doesn't want you to be like him. God's holding out on you. He has proven his love. He spared not his own son. How will we, he not with him freely give us all things? His gift. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He so loved that he gave. And what did he give? He, he gave his son, the son of his love. He proved his love. His love is without question. Our circumstances provide us with opportunities to conquer that first sin with malice and forethought, to go after it just as hard as we can because we know God is good, that God loves us, that he is not holding out on us. Even if we don't have clothes to wear nor food to eat, God has proven his love to us. In the sacrifice of his own son on the cross. It is unquestionable for those who are people of faith. And those who are people of faith. In these things they will conquer doubt and fear. By knowing his love. Lord we thank you this morning. For your mercy and your grace Lord. And Lord as, as I stand here before this people. And I. I've laid out all that I know to, to say, Lord. I, I just pray that, that you'll cause this word to live on the inside. God, that, that victory would be more consistent and complete, Lord, over every area of conflict that we find ourselves in, it, where everything that would hinder and oppose, Lord, would be confidently and completely conquered in the heart of this people lord we just pray for those who whose weakness is more real to them than your strength god we pray lord for the breakthrough of your power lord that you will prove yourself lord to their hearts strong and capable in giving them victory in the areas of their weakness lord and lord we thank you we thank you for your great and precious promises, Lord, which you've given us that, that we can be partakers of your nature, Lord. 
So Lord, we just pray that we would grow up in maturity in all things in Christ. For that, we will be eternally grateful. Amen. God bless you. Okay.